Hi, this is Dr. Tim Green, and I'm here with Dr. Richard Mayer. Uh, Dr. Mayer, thank you for taking your time and to let me interview you. It's my pleasure. Dr. Mayer is a professor of psychology at the University of San California, Santa Barbara. Uh, he has been there since 1975. He has done a ton of work uh, on multimedia learning, uh, the science of instruction in e-learning. I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, he's written over 500 publications, uh, numerous chapters, books. Uh, it, I mean, literally the list goes on and on. We've all read tons of your work, and I'm so happy to be able to ask you some questions based upon a chapter that you wrote for the Handbook of Research on Educational Communications and Technology, the latest edition, and it titled appropriately Multimedia Instruction. So I kind of want to start there. I know it's it's a general question, but some of those who are uh, listening and watching this video, it, it's a good place to start. So in your words, what is multimedia instruction? Okay, well, um, all I mean by multimedia instruction is using both words and pictures um, with the intention of helping people learn. So by words, I mean either spoken or printed text, and by pictures, I mean uh, still graphics such as illustrations, photos, charts, graphs, or dynamic um, graphics such as video or animation. So if you're using both words and pictures and putting them together to try to help people learn, I think then you're engaging in multimedia instruction. So um, what's interesting, I think, is I feel like kind of the history of education we have traditionally focused on verbal forms of communication. So uh, textbooks or lectures are very um, word-based. And the real issue I'm kind of interested in with multimedia learning is, uh, is there a value added by also incorporating graphics? Very interesting. And, and I think one of the interesting things you just said is analog and digital. You, so you said print-based and computer-based, so digital. Both of those are part yes. of multimedia instruction, or can be. Right. So a textbook can be multimedia. If it has illustrations and printed text, according to my definition, that's multimedia. Yeah, and we often forget that since you know most of what we see is digital now, and we, we often forget that. So why should we incorporate multimedia instruction in teaching and learning? Why should we even care, especially for maybe new teachers who are out there? Why, why should we care about this? That's a, that's a really good question. And I, I will say, you know, basically for my whole career, I've been interested in instructional methods that promote deep learning and, and basically um, promote transfer, being able to use what you can have learned in new situations. And I think transfer has a very long history both in psychology and in education. Um, it's been a goal. It's been a goal for a long time in the science of learning and also in education to help people learn in a way so they can transfer. Um, so if we're trying to build transferable knowledge, how should we teach? That's kind of the question I'm interested in. And um, I would say at some point I got um, interested in graphics as a way of promoting understanding. Um, if we add graphics to text, does that people, uh, help people understand better? So I've been focusing mainly on scientific text and uh, to some extent on math, um, teaching of mathematics, and asking, do people learn better if you add graphics to the um, verbal instruction? And what we have found in our research is that um, um, you can teach pretty well with just words, and, and people perform adequately on tests. But if you add graphics, you can greatly increase people's performance on problem-solving transfer tests. Um, so the uh, effect size in a typical study is in the uh, what, what we would call the large range, somewhere about um, 0.8 uh, effect size, 0.8 standard deviation. So that's considered a, a large effect in the world of instructional interventions. So I would say the reason for being interested in multimedia instruction is that it has potential to improve student understanding. And if we're interested in performance on transfer tests, we want people to understand deeply, then using both words and graphics might be a way to accomplish that. So I call that the multimedia principle. People learn better from words and pictures than from words alone. and the kind of the rest of my research has been focusing on 
well, what's the best way to mm -hmm. incorporate words and pictures? Because it's not just any any picture and any set of words, but what's the best way to design instruction with words and pictures? So I think that's my reason for kind of being interested in multimedia learning is it's been demonstrated to greatly improve performance on problem solving transfer tests. And that's a great reason. <laughs> It is. You, you mentioned words and pictures. Where does where does audio come into that? I mean, do you what do you how do you see that playing a role? Well, the audio is what I mean by words. So okay. It, you can either have printed text or spoken. So, so, text. so either way. And so yeah, audio. Okay. Um, and one of our principles is the uh, modality principle, mm -hmm. which is that uh, in a lot of situations, it's better to have audio than printed text. If you're going to have a fast-paced animation or a fast-paced video, having captions um, can create split attention so people can't really uh, process the graphics uh, in the depth they should. So we can offload some of that um, um, impact on the visual system onto the auditory system by using audio for the words and um, using our eyes for the video part. Excellent. Thanks. So related to this, I mean, in reading, reading your chapter on multimedia instruction, one thing that jumped out is you, you talked about the cognitive theory of multimedia learning mm -hmm. and that. Can you describe that, what the foundation or major principles of that is and how we might apply that in designing instruction? Sure. I, you know, I think it's important to, when we design instruction, to kind of start with um, some grounding in the science of learning. Uh, it's a field that's been around for a hundred years, and I think we finally have, um, you know, uh, developed a theory that is relevant to instructional design. Um, so, the cognitive theory of multimedia learning is is basically taking the information processing model that really has been around since the late '60s and and even before, and just adapting it slightly to um, an educational setting. The idea is that information comes in from the outside world. It first impinges on our eyes and ears and enters sensory memory. So um, we might have um, uh, kind of a photograph kind of uh, view of the world through our eyes and auditory echo through our ears. But that information fades very fast, so we have to pay attention to it. Um, so the first real cognitive step is selecting the relevant incoming information for further processing. If we pay attention to some of that information in sensory memory before it fades away, it goes to working memory, which is a very limited capacity store. Um, and in working memory, we can um, mentally rearrange the information. Um, so the next step really there is to organize the information in some meaningful way. Um, and then also activate information from relevant information from long-term memory, um, bring it into working memory and integrate it with the incoming information. I call that integrating. So the, the three main memory stores are sensory memory, working memory, and long-term memory. All the kind of learning activity is in working memory where we have to select the relevant information, mentally organize it, and integrate it with relevant prior knowledge. So According to this theory, meaningful learning depends on being able to carry out those three important cognitive processes in a memory store, working memory, which is very limited in capacity. So that's kind of the nature of the human um, information processing system. We have very limited capacity, but we, in order to learn deeply, we have to engage in a lot of processing. So I... Translating that to creating multimedia instruction, those elements need to be present or at least uh, talked about and dealt with as you uh, create instruction. I mean, how do you see that playing out? So I think um, I should have mentioned one other aspect of the system, which is what I would call dual channels. Um, we have a verbal channel and a visual channel so that um, we can, uh, there's a limit on the verbal channel on working memory and a, and a limit on the visual channel and we can kind of work between those two. Um, so but the way I think it plays out is we want instruction that is going to do three three things basically so there's really three instructional goals. One is to reduce extraneous processing 
since we have such a limited capacity, we don't want to waste our precious processing resources on cognitive processing that doesn't support the instructional goal. So poorly designed instruction just you know, wastes the learner's cognitive processing and therefore there's less capacity left over to engage in the processes of organizing the material and integrating it. Um, so, um, so one step, one big goal is to reduce extraneous processing, have very clear, well-organized instruction that will keep people on track. Another is to, um, so one way to do that would be to eliminate any extraneous material from the lesson. So it's just focusing on the essential material. Uh, another goal is to what I, what I would call foster essential processing. So this is cognitive processing needed to mentally represent the material that's presented. And we can, sometimes if the material is very complicated, we can help people with that by breaking it down into parts, which I call the segmenting principle, or giving people some pre-training on the definitions of the key um, concepts. That is a way to kind of um, help manage essential processing. And then lastly, um, another instructional goal is to foster generative processing, which is a deeper kind of processing where you integrate what's presented with what you already know, reorganize it in a way that makes sense to you. Um, that requires kind of more motivation, more effort on the part of the learner. And some um, techniques that help do that are, well, the multimedia principle, using words and pictures. Another principle we have is the personalization principle, which involves communicating in a conversational style, like using first person, I and you, rather than um, first and second person, um, rather than just formal presentation. So does that make sense? Oh yeah, no, it all it all does, and that's great. Thank you for that summary. That's very that's very helpful. So kind of switching a little bit, talking about just the, the research on multimedia learning. Where do you see? Do you see any major areas where it's heading? Or I mean, I could ask this another way. What what's your major areas that you're working on right now? Okay, well, you know, it's a really interesting field. Um, I think it's evolved over the years. At first, it was focused mainly on. Uh, illustrations in textbooks and in the 80, in the late 80s and early 90s, I think that was the focus. But now it, it has evolved more to um, computer-based um, learning, although I think the principles are, the, are basically the same, whether we're talking about a print medium or an online medium. I, I think what's happened, um, what's happening now or in the future is going to be um, the development of more principles of how to design um, multimedia instruction. I have a set of about 12 research-based principles that are based on uh, dozens of um, studies. But I think what we're also going to do is find the boundary conditions for those principles. You know, by that I mean when are they most important and when are they least important. For example, many of these principles are most important for uh, uh, low prior knowledge learners. High prior knowledge learners um, probably don't need <laughs> as well defined as well designed instruction as mm. the low prior knowledge learners. So one thing we find is that sometimes when we partition the, the learners into low prior knowledge and high, we get much stronger effects for good instructional mm. design with the low low prior knowledge learners, which I guess makes sense. But there are a lot of other boundary conditions for a lot of these principles. They're not like laws written in stone. I think they, they work because of what we know about how, how the human information processing system works. So there are going to be situations where they're going to be more or less effective. So I think what we're going to find is, as I said, boundary conditions for the principles. And as for my own research, um, I'm kind of getting interested in uh, educational games, which mm. is, I guess, a little bit of an extension of research on multimedia learning. because. Most educational games are multimedia and that they involve graphics and words. Um, a lot of strong claims have been made for the potential of games to revolutionize education, but um, I think those claims are based on pretty weak evidence. So what I would like to do is take kind of a rigorous scientific approach to educational games and try and figure out what works, what doesn't work, you know, are there off 
off the shelf games that actually have a positive effect on cognitive skills? Are there design principles for games that um, um, would apply that would help us design games that are more effective? So that's what I that's kind of what I've been trying to do. Excellent. That that, that sounds sounds very interesting and exciting. Educational games is obviously a huge area right yeah. now. I, I have a, a book that, if I'm allowed to say this, that just came out on called Computer Games for Learning, where I try to summarize the research on, on educational games, looking at what I call the value-added approach, which is taking an educational game and adding an instructional feature to it and seeing, does that help learning? The cognitive consequences approach, which is taking an off-the-shelf game um, and asking, does that improve a cognitive skill compared to doing some other activity that is not that game? And there are some perceptual skills that can be improved by playing games. And then lastly, the me media comparison studies where people look at learning from a game versus learning from conventional media to see which is best. So in some cases, a PowerPoint presentation can be more effective than learning from an adventure game that's supposed to teach a scientific concept. So I, I, I break the field into those three genres of research and kind of look at what the evidence says in each of those. Excellent. And I, I mean, I, I've, I've seen that. When, when did the book come out? It just came out a couple of months ago. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for mentioning that. That's, uh, people will definitely want to pick that up and take a look at it. Oh, of course. How could they not? <laughs> yeah. no, I, I, uh, the people who are watching this will definitely want to. Um, I, I like to end all of my interviews with a question dealing with advice. So uh, I have a variety of different people who, who watch these and listen to them, instructional designers, teachers, and others who are involved in media development. So what, what advice do you have for instructional designers or teachers and multimedia developers um, about designing multimedia instruction? Well, for one thing, I, I think you know, folks who are actually designing the instruction, you know, are doing uh, a really important job because, um, you know, uh, education and training are, are crucial for our society and designing effective training and instruction is, is very important. Um, and I also think um, the kind of issues that instructional designers have, have has driven my research and driven a lot of research in the learning sciences. So I think the practical questions are helping improve um, research. So I, I appreciate the, the need to always look and see hmm, what really works in the real world. That, that's, that's important. Um, but the advice I would give is um, I think it's important to um, be grounded in, uh, in the science of learning. So have a good conception of how human learning works. Um, how the human information processing system works because that helps you make um, decisions about design and also um, base things on research-based principles of instructional design. We know a lot about how to design multimedia instruction at least based on our, our lab studies um, so I think a lot of that is relevant to actual actual um, <laughs> instructional design in the real world so those are my two, really my two pieces of advice. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, again, I, I appreciate you taking your time out to let me interview you. Uh, I've enjoyed in, uh, talking with you, and it's been a, a privilege, and I, I thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks, Thanks Tim, for interviewing me.